In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The friends of Christ Jesus, first of all, let me thank your pastors for giving me the opportunity to share the gospel with you, the Word of God. It's a great privilege for me to do that, and also for your leadership and them for inviting us in, the consultation team and myself, to help uh, with your congregation. I bring you greetings from the Indiana District uh, office. Um, you are part of the Indiana District, which includes all the LCMS parishes in the state of Indiana, as well as a good portion of Kentucky. Let me begin by asking you two questions, which I believe are worth asking. And the first one is this, why do we remember the Reformation year after year? And the second is similar, why do we rejoice in remembering the Reformation year after year? And I would submit to you that the answer to these two questions is not so much tied up into a monk named Martin Luther, but rather the answer to these two questions is all about the wonderful, gracious, loving, only God of the universe, the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our sermon text for this morning is recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. I'd like to read it to you again. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is our sermon text. The translation of the Greek that I just read to you renders the word agalos here as angel. But there's another way that you can translate that word. You can translate it as messenger. And the early Lutheran divines, that is the theologians in years before us, before our time, Lutherans, and the early Lutheran pastors attributed this text to Martin Luther. Because they said God used Luther as the messenger of the gospel to the church. <coughs> God did use a little known monk named Martin Luther to change the church of his day, and in fact to bring forth to the fore of the Christian church's understanding the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ at the time of Martin Luther had been clouded over. Some would say it had actually been hidden from the church of Luther's day. Now this didn't happen overnight. This happened gradually through the centuries from the beginning of the church till the time of Luther. Tradition and reason had been elevated to the same status of God's word. A whole system of making money for the church had developed through the years so that by the time Luther was a young monk studying to be a priest in an Augustinian monastery, the church of his day taught that one needed to do good works to gain favor before God so that you could gain heaven, so you could be saved. What they taught was when you were baptized, Jesus got you started. You were infused with some of his righteousness, but it didn't cover all of your sins. You had to take care of your sins yourself. And you did that through good works. So you had to complete your own salvation. Well, along with this teaching, another noxious doctrine developed, and that is called the theology of doubt. You never knew when you had done enough.
I know this theology of doubt is still around. I had a friend who was a priest who was head of a convent when I was serving my first parish in Arkansas, and he passed away. He was an older man than I. Um, and so I went to his funeral out of respect for the man that I knew. And the priest who conducted the funeral preached the sermon and so forth, and I went to him afterwards and I said to that priest, you really don't know where Father so-and-so is, do you? And his answer to me was, no, we teach a theology of doubt. And what he meant by that was, and what was proclaimed throughout that sermon was, we need to be praying and doing things for the father who had passed away so that we can make sure that he gets out of purgatory someday and then get entrance into heaven. You see, purgatory is a place where you go after death to purge your sins. Now that happened early on in my ministry because I was a young pastor in 1982, if you can believe that. Later on in life, my last parish, I went to see the doctor. I had my collar on. He's a friend of mine, still is today. And the doctor said, what you been up to, Jeff? And I said, well, I just conducted a funeral. And he got this sad look on his face, and he said, I know Christians ought to be happy when Christians die, but it just can't be. And I said, Doc, why is that? And I kind of knew, because I knew his background. I knew what he was going to say. And he said, because you never know how long you're going to be in purgatory. And purgatory is not a pleasant place. You still got to take care of your sins. You see, in that church, the way that you purge your sins in purgatory is you have to rely upon the living in this life. And so they are to light votive candles on your behalf, paying for them, of course, or have masses said by the priest on your behalf, and you've got to pay for that as well, or maybe buy an indulgence for you, which is a way of sort of buying the good works of Jesus to cover sins so that you can be forgiven. The notion that has been perpetuated is that Jesus has this big storehouse, this treasury of good works that you can get through money, of course. You have to have indulgences and that sort of thing done. Uh, Martin Luther had been raised in this church. This is what he knew. It was their penitential system in that day. And Luther, <clears throat> as I said, this is all he knew, but as he began to study God's word, these things didn't make sense to him. In God's word, Luther found that the teachings of the church of his day were wrong. God didn't require that one had to attain merits before God with one's works. Holy Scripture taught a different way of salvation. And one of the key points of the Reformation that you can see here is sola scriptura, scripture alone. And that was emphasized to get rid of all the tradition and all the human reason. God's word is enough. After all, it is the inspired and inerrant word of God, right? It's the absolute truth in this world. And so, as Luther began to study Scripture, this reality of God's Word gave him comfort. And we still cling to it today because we say, that the Word of God is the sole rule and norm for our faith and life. When one relies upon the Word of God for absolute truth, one will not be disappointed. It is God's Word. It is inspired. It is without error. It is the truth that God has given to us to guide us in our life and in our faith. Well, as Luther dug deeper and deeper into God's Word, he found that much of what he had been taught, as I said, wasn't true. Particularly troublesome to Luther was how he stood before God. 
the emphasis of the church of his day upon good works only caused him to fear. And at one point he tells us that he, he became angry at God. He hated God because what he read in God's word were passages like this in Leviticus 27. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16 in the New Testament, which states, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Passages like these made Luther afraid because he understood his own sin. And he understood that God hates sin. He hates your sin, he hates my sin, he hates sin wherever he finds it. Do you realize that? And God punishes sin, he doesn't ignore it. You're not like some indulgent grandfather who pats you on the head and says, that's okay. No, that's not, that's not true. God hates sin. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 20, we read, the soul who sins shall die. That word's for you, it's for me. Which of you hasn't sinned? Raise your hand if you've never sinned. I'm glad nobody raised their hand. Again, Holy Scripture tells us we all have sinned. We're all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And in Romans 6.23, Paul tells us what we get with that sin for the wages of sin is death, and he's not talking specifically about physical death. He's talking about eternal death, which is a lot worse than just dying physically. In Scripture, we're told what eternal death is like. Jesus says that it is the place of the outer darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I don't know about you, I've wept some, but I've never wailed and gnashed my teeth in sorrow. And I pray that I never do. That doesn't sound very comforting to me, does it to you? They're really not some place that I want to end up. Do you? So, if all of us sin, and what we earn with sin is eternal death, and we really can't pay for our sins, what are we supposed to do? You see, that's why Luther was angry with God. His attitude at that point was, how dare you, God? Why did you make me this way? What are we to do? Well, we rejoice in the reformation of Martin Luther because God used Luther to bring forth to the fore of Christian teaching God's answer to our sin. Through the majority of the first part of this sermon, I've been preaching the law to you. Have you felt its pinch? I intended it to do that to you. And now I want to share with you the gospel. I want you to understand the gospel. Luther rejoiced in the truth that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. This didn't come immediately to him. But the more he studied Holy Scripture, the clearer it became to him. A wonderful passage which was read in our epistle lesson for today, and I'm going to read the greater portion of it, starting with verse 21, opened this truth to Luther. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, listen to this, are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? Is it excluded, or it is excluded? By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And so another rallying cry became the bottom one, sola gratia, faith al or grace alone. God does it for us. 
It's pure grace from him. That's why we can rejoice in our salvation, because it doesn't rely on us one bit. You know how important that is? You really understand? I didn't say this in the first sermon, and uh, Pastor Lou, the translation doesn't include this either. I'm a grandfather, got 12 kids. I had to get it in sometime, right? Grandfathers brag about their kids, but uh, their grandkids. I love my grandchildren, and I, I promise to do things for them. But I also have to confess to you sometimes I haven't been able to keep my promise. All right? If you ever wanted to do things and you just didn't get it done? So if our salvation relied upon our ability to do something, it would never be certain, would it? Not at all. But since it relies upon God completely and it is a gift from him to us, we can be certain. Because God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Doesn't change. That's why the Lutherans love that phrase, grace alone. And I pray that you still love it today. The answer to our salvation, the answer to cover our sins, is not to work harder and harder in doing good works so that we might somehow make satisfaction before the Holy Trinity. The truth of Scripture is clear. We're justified by God's grace as a gift. Jesus has redeemed us, that is, he has paid the purchase price that the law demands for ourselves, for our sins. Remember I said earlier, the soul that sins shall sur surely die. What is so wonderful about what God has done for us is recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where we read, He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might receive his righteousness. What a wonderful exchange occurs for us. Our sins Jesus takes and pays for, and he gives to us his righteousness as a gift. We're declared righteous for Jesus' sake. And that means you can go to bed at night not worrying about tomorrow. Why? Because if you live or die, it doesn't matter. You're still the Lord's. You're righteous before the Heavenly Father. You don't have to fear the future either. Because God gives you many promises. And one that I love is Romans 8, 28. All things work for the best for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. It's a gift. You know, when we think about Jesus perfectly fulfilling the law for us, I think sometimes we maybe don't realize how difficult it was for him. How many of you remember from your catechism days the, uh, the distinction of uh, the state of humiliation and, and the state of exaltation? Do you remember that? And the state of humiliation, that is when Jesus walked the earth, basically, when he was conceived of the Virgin Mary, when he when he took on human flesh, he did not fully and always use his divine attributes. So that means that when he experienced the temptations that you and I experience, he dealt with them as a man. With one difference from you and I, we always, or very often, fall into the temptation and sin. Jesus never did. But that doesn't mean that he didn't feel the temptation. He did. And that makes all the difference. He knows what we go through. So we have a high priest, our Lord Christ, whom we can go to knowing he understands what we're going through. And he has the answer for us. Jesus took your punishment and my punishment, the punishment of all mankind, upon himself, as I've said, because the law demands the soul who sins must surely die, and he died in our places. He paid the price of our sins completely. We don't have to wonder if they're paid for. He's done it. 
He did this for us so that we might be freed from the slavery to sin and from our slavery to eternal death. Christ did this for us so that we might receive from him forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. So how do we receive these wonderful treasures? Well, that leads us to this statement here, sola fide, faith alone. You remember what you were taught in catechism about the Holy Spirit? Third article, the explanation, what is it? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, sanctifies me, and keeps me in the one true faith, right? And that's what he does for all Christian people the world over. Who's doing the work? You or God? God. And again, do you know how wonderful that is? We rely upon God, and he doesn't let us down. We don't manufacture our own faith. It is a gift from God to us. Indeed, in the natural state which we are born in, we are all enemies of God. We are selfish, self-serving creatures. We cannot save ourselves, as I've already stated in this sermon. We need someone outside of ourselves to save us, and that is what God does for us. The Holy Spirit comes to us in the words and through the water of holy baptism and where there is a sinner, one is converted to saving faith. Sometimes people are brought to faith as adults. The word of God works. If they hear that law and gospel proclaimed, they are brought to faith in Christ. And with this hand of faith, we receive for ourselves the blessings of forgiveness of our sins and life eternal. And that is not all. The Holy Spirit continues to work in our hearts and minds through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, through your meditation upon that Word of God, so that He enables us to become more and more Christ-like. That we call sanctification. Our good works that the Holy Spirit enables us to do are not so that we can somehow satisfy God so that he'll let us into his heaven. It's rather that we are conduits of God's love, of his grace, of his mercy through us as we serve our neighbor. So you're God's hands, his feet, his mouth in this world. What a great blessing that is. We respond in thanksgiving to God's grace with these works that God enables us to do. So sola scriptura, scripture alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fides, faith alone. These are wonderful truths that we learn from God as he teaches us in Holy Scripture. These are wonderful truths which enable us to have great joy and happiness in our lives. They are wonderful truths which are certainly worth us remembering once a year. But more than that, they are wonderful truths which we have the privilege to share with others. Because there are many people that you know who don't know this. And how are they going to hear? How are they going to know unless you tell them? In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.